Last week, we laid out the structure of the Beatitudes. But just a show of hand, the teacher of me, who's ever heard of the Beatitudes? Amen. All right. And most of you probably have heard of them and know what they mean. Okay. And if you know what they mean, that's great. If not, take this as a teaching lesson. Okay. Last week, just to recap, and if you miss one, you can always go online and see that we keep the series up because we want you to learn on about the Beatitudes. Last week, we did a social reconstruction of the text. And as we socially reconstruct the text, Jesus had just started his ministry. According to Matthew, he had just started his ministry. He went in the wilderness to be tempted. He had came out and he began to preach. Now, we said this last week, and it's very instrumental for you to understand the Beatitudes. Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry is encapsulated with two things, preaching, teaching, and miracles. Preaching, teaching, and miracles. We saw that from the text last week. And sandwiched between Matthew 4 and also uh, Matthew 9, you have the Beatitudes. So if you look at the life of Jesus, his earthly ministry, 30 years of ministry, it was preaching, teaching, and miracles. Okay? Okay? So, encapsulated that, he is now teaching. It is the early part of his ministry. We said that. He went right outside to uh, uh, Gezeneret or the lake of uh, Tiberias, wherever mountain he was, in that region, in that area. And people followed him. And we said last week, and we'll say it again, every t- when Jesus teaches, we see in Matthew 1, uh, Matthew 1, Matthew 1, 1, it says, when Jesus began, he saw that the crowds, he went up to a mountain, and he sat down, and his disciples came to him. Now, we say every time we have a group of church meeting, Macedonia, any church, any time there's teaching, there's two types, there's two groups in every crowd, in every church, every time the word goes forth. There's the crowd, and there's what? His disciples. So, understand who he's talking to. Understand to his tackle. So when you get the message, you got to understand how they would receive that. And we're going to see that the crowd, who were not his followers, is astonished by his teaching. But the believers, and if you are believers, then the believers are encouraged and taught by his teaching. It's given directives of how to live their lives. Let's do a little construction. We see with the Beatitudes, there's eight of them. Because verses uh, 9, uh, verses 10 and 11 is one. You may see some people to say that there's nine Beatitudes, but there's really only eight Beatitudes. Okay? And we see that the first Beatitude and the last Beatitude is a promise. Okay? It is a promise. It is an assurance. Verse 1, the first Beatitude in 3 says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the first beatitude. And the last beatitude, which is the eighth beatitude, he says, theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. But we see the second through the seventh beatitude is what? They shall, or they will, or they will be, or they will see God, or they will be called. Those are future assurances. Future assurances. He starts off with promises, he ends with promises, and in the middle, there are what? Assurances. It will happen. Now, last week, we, Jesus began, I'm just giving you a warm-up from last week. Last week, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. We understand what the word blessed means. We talked about that last week, come from this Latin word which means supremely happy, as if somebody is so happy that they're skipping down the road. A burden or a, uh, a debt has been paid. And we see throughout the scriptures, when you talk about the Beatitudes, if you are the crowd or you are a disciple, you have to understand that blessed in the Bible is never, ever, 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 never, ever, 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 never, never related to material things. And in particular, money. So don't be running up talking about you blessed just because you got money. That's a great thing to have. There's nothing wrong with money. Don't get it twisted. But we tie blessings to what? 
material thing. But in the Beatitudes, there's Jesus, if he wanted to tie blessings to material things, he, this would have been a great place to do it. So he starts out, blessed are the poor in spirit. We talked about that last week. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Poor in spirit, as we talked about, is the ones who understood in their totality how messed up and weak they are. Anybody here poor in spirit? And see, poor in spirit, if you got to understand, let's stop it, Brooke, stop it. You're teaching, you need to go to the third. You just, you should have said that last week when you was up. Why are you trying to break it to you now? Come back to your, he brought it back to my members. You got to understand the beginning now. You got to understand the beginning. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But theirs is the kingdom of, kingdom of heaven. Okay? You can't say I was poor in spirit. That is a constant state. In the Greek language, that is what you call the present tense. And in the present tense, you got to understand it, it has uh, present and future implications, which means it is ongoing. So if you're a child of God, you have to constantly be what? Poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. Poor in spirit is realizing you say, listen, I understand that I have a sin problem. And nothing I could do, I could get rid of this sin problem. Nothing I can do that I am. I've done everything. I try to do stuff, but I am just something in me. It just is something. Talk to me. I ain't got the only one that got that problem. I ain't the only one got that sin problem. I told you last week. I wake up every day and I remind myself, boy, you a sinner. I lose a little weight. I say, oh boy, I lost a little weight. But I said, mm, you a sinner who lost weight. I have good days, OT. But I said to myself, you a, a sinner who had a what? A good day. But you're still a sinner, and you are in need of a Savior. And the secondly, he says, if you understand that, then secondly, the blessed are those who mourn, for they will, future, will be what? Comforted. And mourning is, once you come, oh, good, this is good. Mm. Once you understand that you're poor in spirit, in a constant state of being poor in spirit, I'm going to get to the third one. Once you understand that, then you constantly are mourning. Blessed are they that mourn, so they should be comforted. This morning is not when preachers or anybody get at a, at a funeral and say, Blessed are they that mourn, so they should be comforted. That's cool. But there's other places in the Bible I can help you with that, fella. But that ain't the text he's talking about. I want you to understand that text. That text is not about a death of a loved one. There's plenty of passages that comforts us with that. There's John 14. There's 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 3-4. Three, uh, three Blessed be the God of all comfort who comforts us in any situation so that we can comfort others with the same comfort we ourselves as received of God. John 14, 1-6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's many questions, but you got to understand mourning is when you get up every day and you say to yourself, man, I got a sin problem that I can't do nothing about. But I got a promise. And the promise is I will be comforted. Future tense, future tense with present, with the present meaning that God still is going to comfort me. And you can't have that comfort totally until you see him. Talk to me, somebody. Anybody other than me, Mr. Porter, been walking this thing for a long time, and you wake up after 34 years, and you've gotten rid of some stuff in your life, but you still wake up and you say, well, but you know, after 30 years, you would think that you would still have it together, but you still got some sin issues. You get rid of this, and this come up. It causes you to what? Mourn. And when you mourn, you say, ah, I said, don't mourn too long, because you will. Hmm. Be what? By the great comfortor. Now in the sermon, I done 15 minutes on last week. Now in the sermon, now he got that. Then he says, blessed are the meek. Then he says, he's got them understanding that. Then he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall what? But before you unpack, before we unpack that, you first have to understand Matthew 5, 16. Don't go to sleep on me. You got to understand five. Before you understand it, you got you to gotta understand uh, Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds, works, and do what? God, your Father, which is in heaven. How many know that everything we do should be to what? Glorify God. Everything you do. 
When you're rooting for the Chiefs today, you glorifying God. How I know, because he's a Chiefs fan. Why else would we get Patrick Mahomes? I mean, I mean, everybody passed on him. He said, for unto us, a quarterback is given. <laughs> okay. All right, all right, Brooks, all right. All right. Everything we do should be to glorify God. Everything we do should be glorify God. With that in context, and his followers are coming, they understand they got a sin problem. They understand they themselves can't deal with this sin problem. He says, now, uh, uh, with all of that, you got to be meek. Everything we do must glorify God. Whatever we do to glorify God, in any case, nothing that we do, listen to me. You gotta, before I can talk about being meek, you got to understand everything you do should glorify God. Everything you do. And he understanding that. Watch this. Reference number two, 1 Corinthians uh, 10th chapter, verses 31 through 32. So whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for what? Even how your, your religious freedoms should be to what? Glorify God for the glory of what? God. Look at verse 32. Do not cause anyone to what? Stumble. Whether Jew, Greek, or the church of what? Wow. So now you got to understand Jesus even preached this sermon on the mount. Why? So that God will get the glory. So he is teaching the sermon on the mount for us to understand the way our character should be for disciples is for God to get the what? glory. Now, you understand that. And now that you understand that, now let's deal with meek. Let's deal with meek. Jesus says, blessed are the meek. What is meek? It comes from a Greek word praos. Praos. It comes from a Greek word praos, which means, and we always translate it as humble. But that is really the second derivative of the word, the second meaning of the word. The first meaning of the word is really mild. Mild or humble. Meekness is a personality trait of gentleness. Humility. Meek is the opposite of pride. Meekness in no way, no way refers to weak or passivity. Meekness in no way refers to weak. I heard people say, I ain't weak. The mere fact that you had to tell me you are weak means you ain't meek. Okay? Or passivity. Let me talk to some of the brothers. And some of the brothers don't want to embrace Christianity because our mentality with Christianity is, man, I ain't nobody's weak. I ain't soft. I ain't soft. I ain't soft. Ain't nothing meek about me, bro. Don't get it twisted, fella. Don't call me meek. Too close to weak. But really, meekness is controlled power. So really, when you say you're not me, it's meaning that you got this engine called anger. How many here don't have an anger problem? Okay. Everybody here has it. Some of us got to control. Amen? I ain't even a cowboy, but I like to see those rodeos. <clears throat> they be at the gate. And they open up the gate. Boom. And they just come out. Ain't that what they do at the rodeo? We got any cowboys here? Let me see if we got any cowboys here. <laughs> because that bull is ready to get out. 
And the only thing that's holding that bull in yeah. is that gate. Talk to me, somebody. All of us got the propensity to go off. <laughs> and that gate. And some of us just kick it down. We don't wait. For somebody to open up the door, you wake up in the morning looking for somebody. I wish you would. I, 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 I wish, I wish you would. But Jesus said, if you follow me, even though you got this sin problem, you got to be able to hold back. Hey! You got to have this power. You got to have, the, you, you got you to gotta be able to harness. Hey! See, see, so you, when you telling me you ain't meek, telling me you're really weak. Because what you're saying is you can't control. Aristotle described meekness as the middle between excessive anger and excessive laziness. Or excessive anger. That's what Aristotle said. He said it's the middle ground between excessive anger and excessive anger. Lack of anger, or having no anger, and excessive anger. That's what Aristotle said. So in all actuality, being meek is not for the weak. My fact, meek really says that you got something in you. The old folk used to sing a song, Misha, something within me. That holdeth the reins. Something within me. I cannot explain. All that I know that there is. Come on, talk to you. Y'all don't know them songs. That's them old songs. Something within me that holdeth the reins. See, you, 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 we, 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 we brag. We brag. They know better than talk about me. They know, they talk to you like that. They know I'll, I'll get back with them. Mm. And you say, I don't want to be me. I do. Do you know why? That's the most powerful man I know. Who's born in a manger. Matter of fact, on December 25th, we're going to be saying, for unto us, a child is born unto us. A son is given. He shall be called a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, a prince of peace, an everlasting father. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive your king. Don't get it twisted, baby. Don't get it twisted. He may be in a manger living in the ghetto, but he got the power, Rem. Don't, don't get me twisted, baby. Don't get it twisted. You didn't put him on the cross. He went on the cross. Don't, don't get it twisted now. All power is given unto him. And he said, I got power to speak things into existence. So if I really wanted to, I ain't even got to call an angel. I can just think it and knock you dead. But what I'm going to do for your sake is I'm going to be meek. Yeah. Woo! Jesus said, come to me all year weary and heavy laden. And learn to me. Take my yoke upon me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you will find rest in your soul. Put reference scripture number three. I'm trying to talk about a man named Jesus. I'm trying to talk about a man named Jesus. So when you talk about you ain't meek, what you saying is you ain't like Jesus. Jesus says, come unto me all you that labor and heady lady and I will give you rest. What's the next verse? 29, please. Take my yoke upon me and learn to me for I am what? Say it again for I am what? Say it again for I am what? Say it again. So Jesus says he is what? Meek. So meek in no way could be scared. Somebody taking your lunch money. Antoine? When people take your lunch money, that's scared. That's because you ain't got the power to fight back. Talk to me, somebody. Who got their lunch money taken? I'm just saying. You can't be my pastor or resident. Not, I'm going to get it. I'm going to give it to you. Okay. So, so don't get me messed up with being weak. So when people say weak people, you say, wait a minute. So you calling Jesus weak. And if you believe he's weak, I don't want to be around when First Thessalonians come to life. When the clouds open up, I'm going to say, they're the meek man. They're the meek man. Now do something with him. Now do something with him. Because he's going to come back like a roaring lion. Come on, talk to me, somebody. 
So I want to be like Jesus. Our actions and our character reflects Jesus. But real quick, in order to understand me, when Jesus said being me, what he has said, you got to have power under control. That's what meekness is. That's power under control. Oh, you got to understand real quick. We'll get out of here. In order to understand what Jesus is saying, he really mirrors uh, Psalms 37 and 11. Psalm 37 and 11 really mir- mirrors Matthew 5, 5. Matthew, my, Matthew 5, 5 is really a mirror, essentially identical to Psalms 37 and 11. And I'm going to say this, and I hope y'all don't think I'm crazy. I don't think I, I, I don't love Jesus. But you got to understand, when Jesus said a whole lot of stuff, and when Jesus teaching, really what he was doing is just quoting Old Testament scriptures. If you look at Jesus on the cross, what he was doing is just really quoting stuff that was in the scriptures. Even when Jesus tells stories, there were stories that had been around way before Jesus came. Jesus came and said those stories that he messed the stories up and he changed the stories. So Jesus, if you understand being meek, you got to understand who a group of people who was under the Roman rule, he would say, now you got to be meek. You got to realize that you got a sin problem. You mourn that problem and you know that people are going to be predators to try to take advantage of you. But in the midst of people trying to take advantage of you, in in the midst of you being under Roman rule and not being able to control yourself, you still got to control your anger. So, Psalms 37, 11, if you want to understand meek, Psalm 37, real quick, I'm going to do five verses of Psalm 37 to teach us what meek really is. And I want you to be the judge of your meek or not. I want you to be the judge. David. Y'all say a whole lot about David, but David is the one who really gives us a description in the Bible of what a meek person is or the characteristics of a meek person. And Jesus said, blessed are the meek. But we'll, we'll do the first verse. So look at the Psalms. Uh, uh, what's that, uh, Tish? Uh, Reverend Scripture number four. Reverend Scripture number four, Tish. All right. Psalms 37 and 11. Psalms 37, this is David writing Psalms 37. Okay, in Psalm 37, 11, it says, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. That is almost a mirror of Matthew 5, 5. <laughs> okay, that's a mirror of that. So understand what meek is, you've got to go back to Psalms 37. And Psalms 37, 5 gives us characteristics of a meek person. A meek, meek people... Commit your ways to the Lord, and they what? Trust in him. Watch this. Meek people trust God. They believe that God will vindicate them when others oppose them. Talk to me, somebody. Meekness is really rooted in the deep confidence that God is for you and that he will work it out. The old folk would say Jesus will work it out. This problem that I have Jesus will work it out. So in order to be meek when you are opposed or persecuted or belittled what you're saying to control that power to be meek is that listen to me I trust that God is going to work it out when I am being opposed. First, first thing is trust. So don't tell me you meek because you don't say something. Because you not saying something could mean you scared. Yeah. And I'm not trying to make fun of you. Yeah. I, I'm not trying to make fun of you. I'm not trying to make people who have been scared. I was bullied in my life. My God was smaller than me. But it wasn't him that I was scared of. It was all his brothers. He came from a big family. And he would just bully everybody in the class. Down and I just got tired of doing what he said do. And I didn't do it like a fool. And we lined up to go home. And we standing up singing goodbye to you today. I'll see you on Thursday. Stop, look, and listen before you cross the street. Use your eyes, use your ears, and then you use your feet. Go straight home. That's when he walked home. We in line singing it. Goodbye to you today. He had told everybody to do something. I said, I ain't doing it. I'll see you on Thursday. And I messed around and looked at him while we were singing. And he said, (laughs) I said, goodbye to you today. And when everybody went out that door, 
I ran out the other day. You see, it's, and it says, stop, look, and listen. I didn't stop. I didn't look. And I showed it and listened to the teacher say, stop. So I've been bullied. I'm not making fun of you. So what I'm saying is, but just because people don't say something don't mean that they weak. But meek people say, I ain't scared of you. What I'm saying is I trust that God will take care of me. Number one. And also, if you look at that passage, the first word of a meek person is commit. A meek person trusts God and they commit their ways unto the Lord. This Hebrew word commit, I found this really interesting. T, I found this really interesting. I want to help somebody understand what meekness is. Meekness is trusting God. And meekness is not only trusting God, but this word uh, commit in the Hebrew really means roll. Like you roll with something. Roll with it. Roll with it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I'm going to roll with that. And it's the same understanding in the, in the Hebrew language, commit. It said they commit themselves. What it does is that people who are meek roll with God's plans. <laughs> so in other words, what they do is say, God, this ain't looking good. I really want to cuss them out. But I trust and commit myself to you, so I'm just going to roll with it. Talk to me, somebody. I'm just going to roll with it. I'm going to roll with your plan because my plan, uh, uh, I'll bust them in the mouth. I'll cuss them out, God. I, see, this ain't got to be me, God, but because I trust you, I know that your way is better than my way, so I'm just going to roll with it, God. So when you see a meek person, all they doing is rolling with God's plan. Talk to me, somebody. Talk to me, somebody. Hey, you ever roll with somebody? Y'all don't. I, you know what I'm saying? So, so what it is is they're saying, I just roll with God's plan. They trust God. They commit their ways. And look at verse uh, uh, Psalms 37, 7. This is what meek people do. They be still before the Lord and wait patiently for them. Once they roll with it, they trust God and they are patient. Meek people do not act on impulse. They trust God. They roll with God's plans and they, and, and they patient. They, 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 they patient. Now you got some Christians. You got some Christians. I wrote this down. I want to make sure I share this with you. Some Christians are just impulsive. They just first thing that come to their mind they say, and they do. Everything. Everything. And if you do this, you'll get in huge trouble. Why well, you got to be the first one to respond? And we see all throughout the Bible, wait patiently for the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Now, I know why you're telling me to do all these things. You're going to be saying, but people are going to be taking advantage of you. They may. But if you trust God, you say, I'm going to roll with it. And I'm going to keep doing things your way. I'm going to keep treating them the way you want me to treat them. Even though they do it, I'm going to keep roll with it. Because I'm going to be patient for you to move and for your will to be done. And understand this. There is nothing Nothing weak about patience. Now you want to be you want to be meek? I'm telling you all the characteristics of Jesus and saying, if you follow me, if you follow me, you gotta be you gotta be meek. And that doesn't mean that there's not a time to fight. But in terms of the meekness, and I've been to some churches. Some of the most evil people in the world. You would think we pay pew taxes. You sitting in my seat. You got a receipt where you pay for the seat? Are we paying pew taxes now? But you represent Jesus. Jesus. 
Meek people are not impulsive. Now, you may say, oh, they're not doing nothing. It's not lazy and because you could be lazy, too. Don't get lazy in this mix of what Not doing nothing is not being lazy. Okay? That's not what it is. It takes strength. Psalm 37b. They trust God. They commit to the Lord. They roll with it. They're patient. And, verse 37b, they do not fret. Go back. When people succeed in their ways. Are you meek? Somebody taking advantage of you. Somebody important. This is all what this is about. See, meekness has nothing to do with just characteristics of walking up. Meekness is only displayed when there's opposition. Understand this now. And the characteristics overflows when you, you, when you embrace life and you embrace things, you become meek. And meek people don't fret when the wicked seems to be winning. Talk to me, somebody. Some of us get upset because we say, you know what? I've been doing it God's way, and I seem not to get nowhere. And people who are doing it any kind of way they want to do it, they seem to be prospering. Bump all this. I ain't rolling with this no more. You got one more time. I'm going to take things into my own hands. And not just with people, but in situations of life. And the truth of the matter is a lot of us are in messed up situations because you don't took situations into your own hands. But David is saying, the meaning show inherited to her from Psalms 37 and 11, and then he gives the characteristics in 5, 6, 7, and 8. These are what meek people do. Are you meek? And Jesus is on the Mount Transfiguration. He's referring to that. He said, if you follow me, you have to be meek. The meek people. The meek people. Look at, look at verse 37, 8. And, Miguel, they refrain from anger. They refrain from anger. Now, I've discovered this in 25 years of pastoring. There are some folk who look for a fight. Some folk who love to argue. Y'all think I'm joking. I did a revival. I ain't going to say where it was, but I did a revival. And I went to the church, and I saw one guy at the church. I said, what you do? He said, I'm the minister of H-E-L-L raising. I said, huh? He said, you heard me. I'm the minister of raising. I said, surely you kidding. He said, no. He said, that's the only way you get stuff done around here. They know you raise them. They ain't going to mess with you. And I thought to myself, don't ever come to Macedonia. Please don't. <laughs> So I asked him, I said, are you happy at your church? He said, yes. I said, good. <laughs> and I told the pastor, I said, you need to watch out. He said, I know he brags about that he's the minister of. And what he is saying, that in order to get people in check, because they're going to try to run over you, I have to raise some what's the name. And when I raise some stuff, then things get done. And unfortunately, too many Christians, we got that mentality. But the meek refrain from anger. There's some people who look for a fight. And then there's some people who don't look for it. But if it comes... Hey, don't, don't start none. <laughs> Those are not meek people. No, no. We challenge you. Those are not meek people. Put 37.8 back up there. 37.8. They refrain from anger.
Why? Because they say, I gotta, whatever I do, I got to glorify God. You're not going to take advantage of me. But this power that I have, I'm not going to unleash it on you. I'm not going to do it. My character, my life, my behavior is going to be reflective of what God would call me to do in the midst of opposition. Why? Because it glorifies God. I'm not trying to entertain you. I'm trying to tell you what Jesus said about meek folk. And people say, well, pastor, what you discovered, what you described, it's like a weak person that people are going to take advantage of you. Psalms 23. The Lord is my what? Say it again. The Lord is my what? What you are saying is you're dumb. You're weak. You need protection. Lions and bears don't need shepherds. A lion is in the woods and I, 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 I tried. I ain't no sheep. Bye, bye. I got to buy for you. The mere fact that we say the Lord is my shepherd. We are saying, God, I need your protection. Because I need you to protect you from myself. Because in and of myself, I'm a sheep and I'm liable to do just anything, God. I need you to protect me, God. I need you to protect me. I shall not want. He made me to lie down in the green pasture. You will provide for me. I ain't got to be like a lion going out for a hunt. And Jesus said, you will refrain from anger. If you want to be meek, Lord, why should I do all this? Why? That's the hardest thing to do, Jonna. Because if you read the second part of Matthew 5 5, that's why you should do it. They will inherit. The translation is really the whole earth. What does that mean? You have to understand Israel and its history. All the way from Genesis 1, from the creation. What did God create? The heavens and the earth. Who did he give the earth to? Adam and Eve. To rule over it, to subdue it, to produce it. What happened? Sin came. Now they had to leave the garden. And they was wondering about because they had no land. God's children historically has always been taken captive by the Babylonians or the Chaldeans. Why? Because they would come and take what? Their land. When Jesus comes on the scene, he rides on the scene. Guess what? God's people have what? No land. Because they are under Roman rule. So when Jesus comes in and they're waiting for a Messiah to give them back their land, they are disenfranchised with this Jewish carpenter because he says, my kingdom is not of this earth. And they said, no, we need for you to overthrow the government because we need our land. And Jesus says, no, that's not it. Here we are in 2022. We live in Kansas City, but guess what? This ain't our land. Yeah, you own a house. And you got the deed to it. But if somebody else is telling you what you can and can't do. And if it was your land, you wouldn't have drug dealers living across the street. Why? Because this ain't your land. But Jesus says, if you be meek, you will inherit. Your land. If you understand Psalms 37, David wrote to a group of people who were being 
attacked where? On their land. And the Israelites was about ready to run and give up their land. But David writes Psalms 37 and he says, no, the meek will inherit the land. They were being treated like dogs. They were being persecuted and they were decided we should just leave our land. And David is saying, no, stay right there and be humble. Love folk. Tell them about God. Tell them about Jesus. When they hate you, you love them. When they treat you bad, you treat them good. Yes, yes, yes. We live in a world that sometimes I wish I could just take my tent and get out of this old wicked place. Because there's so much sin around. But God says, no, John Leslie, keep fighting. Why? Because you one day will inherit the land. Every now and then, I get out and I just stop and I look around Kansas City. And they say, what you looking at? I say, I'm looking at the land that God is going to give me. Truth going to be mine. Prospect is going to be mine. Over the park is going to be mine. Lenexa, Kansas, that's mine. Hollywood, baby, that's mine. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm going to tell you why it is. You said somebody else earned that land. Well, he says you will what? Wait a minute, Brooks, you said, oh, this is your land? Yes, and guess what, Cynthia? I ain't even got to fight for it. All I got to do is hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle. I just got to be meek. I just got to be lowly. I just got to be humble and keep praying and keep trusting, and I ain't got to fight for the land. I will inherit When you inherit something, you sit at a place and they say, what did they leave me? You ain't done nothing, but you got a father who loved you. You got a father. You got a mother who worked hard, who saved, who saved. Now they want you to have the inheritance. Yes, yes, yes. One day, y'all, this is going to be ours. Yes. If that don't make you shout, I don't know what will.